All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is May Bouvi. I'm the executive director of 350.org. We're an international climate change campaign, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you today and have really enjoyed being in the audience and getting to learn about all the wonderful work that so many of you are part of and supporting. And it is a very important time for us to be thinking together about taking back power. I feel pretty sick about the state of this country and the state of power in this country in particular. And I believe that a radical rethink is essential if we're going to face inequality, white supremacy, structural sexism, structural racism, and rebuild an economy that provides us with a livable planet, reducing the threat of climate chaos. So it's hopeful to be here with all of you because this project requires a lot of imagination. If we can't imagine a different present or a different future, we're going to be stuck where we are for a long time. So to be surrounded by people who live in a world of imagination, of believing something different can come into being, is I think just the right place to be at this moment. So today I want to share a few ideas with all of you about how we at 350.org think about building power and how creative change strategies are essential in that work. First, I want to provide a little window into the Anthropocene, which if it's a new term for you, it refers to the current geological era, which scientists are describing as being known for its, the influence of human activity being the single most significant determination for our current era, which is unlike any geological era for all of, all of time. So I want to start with a quote from the wonderful writer Rebecca Solnit, who I think has been here in the past. No problem more clearly demonstrates, I'll read it from here. No problem more clearly demonstrates the folly of individualistic thinking or more clearly calls for a systematic response than climate change. The ideologues of isolation are doubly challenged by this fact. They reject the proposed solutions to climate change because they bristle at the need for limits on production and consumption, for regulation, for cooperation between industry and government, and for international partnership. On a more fundamental level, the very idea of climate change is offensive to isolationists because it tells us more powerfully and urgently than anything ever has that everything is connected, that nothing exists in isolation. What comes out of your tailpipe or your smokestack or your leaky fracking site contributes to the changing mix of the atmosphere where carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases cause the Earth to retain more of the heat that comes from the sun, which doesn't just result in what we used to call global warming, but will lead to climate chaos. Climate change is connected to everything else. Whether or not you live in a neighborhood with good access to public transportation and businesses you can walk to, that means fewer cars and fewer carbon emissions that lead to climate change. Whether you are an indigenous person defending your land and water from a pipeline, as they are at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation as we speak, and your home and your rights are threatened in order for an oil company to keep burning carbon and make more money, that is connected to climate change. Whether you watched in horror as hundreds of people in Haiti died over the course of last week as devastation from Hurricane Matthew wreaked havoc on that country. These storms are worse because climate change leads to more rainfall, more flooding, and greater storm surges. But the good news is, excuse me for a second, we know what needs to happen. Science, oh, sorry guys. How am I doing? Can you hear me? Great. A brand new study that came out a couple of weeks ago from Oil Change International revealed something that hadn't been known before. That in order to keep the temperature of this whole planet that keeps us all in a comfortable environment we can live in, we can't actually build any more pipelines, any more fracking wells, 
any more coal plants. This is news. There was still a belief for some time that actually new construction could continue. But we know now that that's not the case. We have to begin the transition to 100% renewable energy right now. And thankfully, that's what's already happening. In fact, this pattern is already underway. Solar prices are falling, which is a very good thing. Investment in coal is also falling. So the pattern that we need to see is happening. And if we can get the fossil fuel industry to get out of the way, this pattern will continue. At 350.org, we work to build a movement that can be inspiring enough and engaging enough to be more powerful than the likes of Exxon. We do this by using creative activism and spectacle. When we started in 2008, I had just graduated from college. And we organized a series of actions all over the world. And we asked people to do one simple thing. Make a 350 and take a picture. 350 stands for the safe level of carbon in the atmosphere. But more importantly, it creates a sense of identity, that we're all in this fight together, and that our creativity can bring, be brought to bear on this huge problem of climate change. And we thought we'd be happy if there were a few hundred events. But in fact, there were 5,200 events in 182 countries. <laughs> And here, here are just a few. This was in Poland. This was underwater in the Philippines. This was from the Yes Men right here in Washington, D.C., the so-called Surviva Balls. <laughs> this was in the northeastern United States in the fall, and on and on like this. People making images and using image and using creativity to show our movement is stronger, our movement is growing. But after this, we felt like we had to do more. And we felt like it wasn't enough just to do these days of action. We had to bring our message directly to politicians. So we started to work on this project to try and stop the Keystone XL pipeline. And nobody thought that that would work. I didn't think that it was going to work. But last November, President Obama stood in his press room in the White House and said, I'm rejecting the Keystone XL pipeline because it will lead to further climate change. And that is a historically unprecedented move because think of all the pipelines that are being built around the world. Think of all the fracking, all the coal plants. We have to be able to stop everyone, and here's an example of a movement rising up to do that. So rather than walk you through that story, I wanted to share a quick video talking about the Keystone fight because I think Unlike anything we've worked on, it's our best example of how movement power and creativity helped take power back. For the first time ever, a big fossil fuel project has been rejected because of its impact on the climate. The pipeline's impact on our climate will be absolutely critical to determining whether this project is allowed to go forward. President Obama's rejection of the Keystone XL pipeline is proof that there's at least some power in the hands of the people. It's important to take a moment to celebrate because this victory did not come easy. It took years of hard work from a big, broad, new kind of movement. We didn't win everything. The southern half of Keystone got built. Big Oil's making another run at Congress to get the pipeline finished. The larger fight against the fossil fuel industry is far from over. So we've got to take stock of what we learned along the way. First and foremost, build a diverse coalition. Every type of person led this movement. Let's stand together and oppose this pipeline. It started with indigenous communities in Canada and ranchers in Nebraska. We do not have to sacrifice to meet TransCanada's bottom line. Then came students, scientists, families, farmers, frontline communities. We all fought shoulder to shoulder. This is my land. Pipeline will not go without a fight. The second thing we learned is don't be afraid to put your body on the line. One of the tools that came into play was peaceful civil disobedience. You are going to be risking arrest. You're going to be lining up on this Thousands side. of us were arrested and went to jail, from the White House to Texas. Sit-ins, blockades, nonviolent direct action showed the moral urgency of rejecting this pipeline. We will stop whatever pipeline you try to build. The third insight, be creative. 
We knew we could never outspend the fossil fuel industry, but we figured we could tap into the currency of movements. We circled the White House hand in hand. We coordinated days of action in communities everywhere. When Obama was on the move, people were there every time to make their voices heard. In all social movement victories over time, people have taken to the streets. Thousands of people marched past the White House. They call for President Obama to reject the Keystone XL pipeline. With opposition to the pipeline as a big rallying cry, we galvanized the biggest climate demonstration the U.S. had ever seen. If this pipeline goes through, it will be at the cost of human life. And then as all these battles intensified, we showed up in droves for the largest climate march in the history of the planet. Lastly, never give up. People said this fight was impossible, that we'd never win, that Keystone was a done deal. They'll tell you the same, whether you're fighting fracking or mountaintop removal or campaigning for divestment or arguing for a serious climate policy in Congress. Don't listen. We are at our lunch counter moment for the 21st century. Do the right thing. Today we act. Today we send a message to them and everybody else. We are taking back our futures! This is the fight of our time, maybe the fight of all time, so be a part of history. Join us. All right, so here we are. It's 2016. We're almost done with this election here in the US. And I have news that I'm excited to be able to share with all of you today, which is that we are hoping to bring hundreds of thousands of people right here to Washington DC in the spring after the new president is here to make it very clear that time is running out on climate change, but the movement is bigger and more powerful than ever. And what I'm, the reason I'm excited is that part of what made the People's Climate March in New York, which took place two years ago, so effective is that the first person who was hired to work on that march was the arts coordinator. Not the campaign director, not the press person, the arts coordinator. Because we know that mobilizations are important because of their look and their feel and the experience of being part of them. And if we're going to keep building stronger movements, we have to be able to tap into our deepest creativity because it gives us hope. And that person, that arts coordinator's name is Rachel Shragas. And I think some of her network is here. Um, yeah, and I actually am interested to know, are there people in this room who were at the People's Climate March two years ago? All right, all right. So we're trying to figure out how we can mobilize again. And I wanna invite every single person here, every person watching on the webcast to come to be part of this. We don't know exactly when it's going to be, but we know we're going to be big, we're going to be bold. And just like in New York, what was key to making that event so powerful is that it was led by the frontline communities who are most impacted by climate change. And that is the same thing we will be doing here, and I invite you to be part. And I don't want to say too much more about that because I actually wanted to share a video from Rachel. And I think Gan Golan was here last year to speak about people's climate arts and this incredible movement of climate activist artists. But that movement is only growing and I welcome you all to, in, to be part of it. At the end, I'll share the email address so you can contact them directly. But I, I wanna share one last video as a way of wrapping this up, just to share, to go a little deeper on this theme of arts and activism in the climate movement. So I'm gonna share that and I want to share some assumptions before you see the video. No, not that. Assumptions. We believe that people on the streets is part of how change is won. Mobilizations rely on a tremendous amount of complex collaboration, months and months of organizing. They don't happen spontaneously, even if sometimes it appears that way. The collaborative ecosystem of organizing is fertile soil for creative engagement, and creativity that happens within the context of organizing is part of how real change happens. In other words, art as an organizing strategy, a time-worn one. No social movement has ever won without artists involved doing what artists do. 
think we can all agree. <laughs> and so I want to share this video from Rachel so she can say it in her own words, and I'll wrap it up by telling you how you can get more involved. The People's Climate March was two years ago. Since then, a lot has happened. And also not nearly enough to address this problem. I think that art is a tool that helps make real change possible. And this image is a tool that helps people think and talk about climate change. So the idea for this poster came right from my experience of being the coordinator of the art team for the People's Climate March. I got to witness people articulating seemingly conflicting priorities and cooperating. I wanted to also share some of the experience the whole two years I was making this piece. I went and talked to organizers. I interviewed people who worked on different parts of the march to help unearth all of the different conflicting imperatives that I saw people express and realized that this idea of overlapping opposites communicated a lot of what we struggled with and I just came up with as many as I could. If you give people more information and more space to ponder the complexity with you, we end up building the kind of community that stays in this fight for the long haul. Addressing the problem means really looking at the root of how we structure society. And it's really an issue of justice, of how in a world that is already so unequal, we don't let this problem make those fault lines of access so much bigger. Energy, agriculture, infrastructure, housing, education, employment, social services, criminal justice. All of these areas that historically were necessary in order to address the needs of our community. Climate change changes all of that. The big challenge is how do we do it together? How do we challenge these systems that really have put us here in the first place? It's complex. But then you look at something like this and you can't help but see that all the solutions are right there. That that intersectionality appears in this, in this art piece. I don't see a lot of movement art or art in general that's trying to speak to what people are struggling with as they try to make change. This is an expression of what social movements are about. It is something that makes me feel tremendously powerful. People are looking for ways of building and working with each other that they've never done before. We need these tools, we need these, this kind of work to be able to deliver that message to people. You see, we were able to work through these complexities and do this thing together. Supporting this project is a way to continually inspire yourself and the people around you to be part of this movement. So here's what I need from you. I need your help to get this image in as many people's hands as possible. In schools, in community centers, places of worship, and in people's homes. The more money we raise, the more copies we'll be able to print exponentially. With your help, you and I and lots of other people will be able to use this image to organize and to build community power to fight climate change for years to come. Thank you so much. All right. So to wrap us up on how to get involved, here are a few ways. First one, when it comes to climate change, do not despair. The news will have you convinced that it's too late to do something about this, but the fact is, we know what the solution is, we just have to accelerate it. Second thing, help people reimagine the future. You're all working on that in various ways, I think, but one specific way, get connected to Vanessa Cuervo, who I think is here. Are you here, Vanessa? Yeah. <laughs> and you can also send an email to peoplesclimatearts at gmail.com to help spread the word. I hope you'll do that. You can also sign the Fossil Funds Free Pledge from the great folks at Platform who are also here. 
So lots of ways to get involved, and I hope you'll do it. And just to close, if you've not been involved in the climate change movement before, if it's felt like a movement that's not welcome, which I know it has before, and if it feels like maybe it's too late, I want to say now is exactly the right time to join in because the decisions that are being made right now will affect hundreds of thousands of years to come. If we make the right ones in the next two and three years, we can actually begin to dream that the climate chaos that we're experiencing now can get better for so many people. So I hope you will join in and thank you very much.